they give away aspects of current treatment in a very, very general way, not looking at specific patients' conditions. Um, and so this is just a diagram of the human body showing you that nets can arise from most parts of the human body, from the thymus, which is just in the upper part of the chest, to the lungs, the esophagus, all parts of the gastrointestinal tract from the stomach down to the rectum. We see a lot of rectal necks, and also organs of the abdomen, uh, such as the pancreas, as well as the appendix. So all parts of the gastrointestinal tract and the airways can, call, can present with necks. And, and because you have different sites, you have different ways of being presenting as well. A lot of them will cause symptoms because of their local issues that they cause, because of pressure on organs, or because they spread to other parts of the body as well. And they're increasing. Actually, they're probably, if you look at total numbers, they're probably much more common than stomach cancer, pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer, for example. Um, even though they're supposed to be a rare tumour. And we do know that the incidence is increasing. The number of cases that we're seeing per year is increasing. This is a survey from the US looking at 1970 to 2005, looking at all the net cases that came that are recorded within their population data and showing you that those little symbols correspond to the different primaries from lung, small bowel, appendix, and pancreas, that for all sites of this, the incidence is increasing. And the US have now published uh, more recent data from the beginning of last year, again showing the same trends. And I've also analyzed the Victorian data, the same trends as well. We're seeing more and more nets. <coughs> why? We're not sure why. Um, possibly because we're investigating patients more thoroughly. We might be doing more CT scans than we would normally do, more PET scans, more endoscopies. And often they're found by accident, so incidentally. And it might also be environmental carcinogen exposure as well. And also in the Victorian data, we tried to see whether there was a greater incidence in the urban population in the city compared to the country population. We didn't actually see many differences at all. And they can present in unusual ways. Most of them present either because they're isolated or they can be multiple. We often see patients with multiple nests from the same organ. Or they can be part of familial syndrome. There's various familial syndromes which do present with nests. For example, MEN1 or neuroplumbrachitosis. And most of these nets present, probably about a quarter of them have <coughs> the metastases and always go to lungs or liver to bone, for example, or a lot of them have, about a quarter of them have regional spread just to lymph nodes, and about 50% are localized as well. And they're often diagnosed late, and you don't know from your most, most of the patients that we see at Peter Mac, some patients complain of symptoms for five to seven years. Rumbling diarrhea, diagnosed as um, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. Um, flushing might be postmenopausal, et cetera. Um, and or rashes, which are ongoing for many years. So they can present for a prolonged period of time. Patients often do see multiple specialists, and we do see this in the patients that come through us, before a diagnosis is suddenly made. It's very uncommon for patients to have a very long diagnostic workup. And in that time, we see that patients will have metastases or develop metastases often during that time, and often they do become symptomatic from their disease or from the hormones causing that disease as well. And in terms of how they present, it depends upon where they come from. If it's from the small bowel or the large bowel, you might have bleeding, you might have obstruction, you might have pain, as I said, it depends on where they go in the secondaries. They might cause bone pain or liver pain and nausea and vomiting, for example. Or we might have the general symptoms of 
a tumor causing weight loss, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, for example. And also, NEDs can be what we call functional. They can secrete hormones which have an effect on the body. And they can produce a whole variety of different hormones. Um, for example, the small bowel tumors classically cause what's called carcinoid syndrome because they secrete serotonin. Um, pancreatic NEDs can produce hormones such as gastrin, which causes stomach ulcers, or glucagon, which causes diabetes, or insulinomes, which cause low blood sugars, for example, and a whole variety of other hormones. So you have to be really aware of what type of presentation the patients have. We can measure a lot of these hormones. And sometimes we actually see that the hormones that tumors secrete may change during time, where sometimes <coughs> they can be non-functional and become mm. functional. We have seen that in some of our patients as well. And the classical syndrome that we see in the majority of patients with small bowel NEDs is the carcinoid syndrome. And because of the serotonin it produces, they can cause flushing, um, they can cause the face to become quite red, deeply red, um, they can cause diarrhea, which is often not related to food can cause abdominal cramps and nausea and vomiting. It may cause scarring of your tissues, especially within the abdomen, or cause scarring around node masses in the, around the small bowel, or cause scarring of the heart valves, and therefore requiring heart valve replacement as well. And for example, the commonest ones we see are the small bowel nets. Often they're found incidentally, by accident, often patients might have just non-specific abdominal pain. As I said, they can produce carcinoid syndrome causing diarrhea. They can also have vague symptoms like loss of weight or loss of appetite, for example. And they can cause bowel obstruction and gastrointestinal bleeding. But as I said, they can also cause scarring of the small bowel, causing the bowel to be starved of the blood supply or causing pain when you're eating because the, 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 the small bowel can't get enough blood to metabolize its food. What we call mesenteric angina. It's the same as heart angina. That's for the bowel, for example. And we see typical carcinoid syndrome in about 20% of small bowel cells. <coughs> and usually we expect to see patients with carcinoid syndrome have liver secondaries, about 95% of patients because what the liver does is break down the serotonin. So if there's no liver metastases, all the serotonin gets broken down by the liver. If there are liver metastases, the serotonin escapes the liver metabolism and goes into the circulation and causes syndrome. Any questions so far? No? So you know the graph that showed the rise of different forms of nets. Where was the thymic nets? Was that included in that? They'll probably come under probably come under lung focus in that sort of area. Yeah. Um, as I said, we can see carcinoid heart disease where we have scarring of the heart valves because of hormone production, causing heart failure. So our patients with carcinoid syndrome or the small bowel again, patients will do an echocardiogram when we first see those patients. It will do one every year as well. And there are some patients that do have valve replacement. We've probably had about, probably about a dozen or more patients that have actually had valve replacement because of severe heart valve pain. Just to, because often by, if they do have severe heart failure because the valves are not working, that's often causes their life to be shortened more than actually having the next disease. So we do correct the valve. There's also a skin condition caused by the carcinoid syndrome called pellagra, where the skin, the body needs niacin for growth and development. And because the tumor has produced a lot of serotonin, it wastes a lot of the niacin. So the body has a severe deficiency in niacin and it causes pellagra. It causes diarrhea, dry skin, sometimes dementia as well. So just an example of 
<coughs> CT scan. Um, I'll show you here. Here's the front, the back, the right, the left. And you can see where that hatched line is with this arrow. There is a small bowel mass. It's a massive lymph nodes and the primary itself. And this is when we cut the section of the body this way, the liver's here, the pelvis is here, and you can see this massive tumour nodules and lymph nodes here as well. It's a very typical appearance of a small bowel here. <coughs> and how do we confirm the diagnosis? Um, we will generally do a workup of patients. We'll take bloods or tumour markers such as chromogranin A, which we do at Peter Mac now. Um, patients with the carcinoid syndrome, we'll do a 24-hour urine collection. If we've got pancreatic urine consumers causing a lot of hormone production, we'll try and measure those hormones if we think that's appropriate. We also do the echocardiogram, as I said, at, at baseline as well. And as part of that workup, we'll do CT scans, MRIs of the liver, and we'll also do some what's called somatostatic receptive or GATA scans now. We've stopped doing the triotide scans. And if we think the patients have a slightly more aggressive disease, we'll do the sugar or FDG PET scan as well. And the advantage of these tumours is that they have these things on their surface. These are the somatostatin receptor subtypes. And most of the nets, whether they come from the small bowel or the pancreas, actually do have various types of somatostatin receptors, which we can use to our advantage in terms of using the hormone injections such as the octreotide or lamreotide to target those receptors or to target radioactivity as well. And this is a um, GATHATE scan where we're looking at those tumours which have the octreotide and the somatostatic receptors on their surface, showing you, you know, disease, the lymph nodes, the bones, the liver, lymph nodes in the abdomen as well. And this is just a cross section showing you the green spots of uh, deposits within the liver and the pancreatic primary as well. You can hardly see them on the CT scan. And the GATA scan will pick up about 30 to 40% more disease. Sorry, just move this down. Just easy. Shows more disease than a CT scan does. And that's our primary sensitivity. This is just another example of this is a patient with pancreatic urine consumer. We're seeing some ill defined masses on the CT scan beneath the liver and the stomach. And here you see the true extent of the disease here with the, lymph, the pancreatic primary and the lymph nodes there as well. And because, and we know that the type of hormone, the type of receptor expression, the somatostatic receptor, does change depending upon the aggressiveness of the disease. We know that those patients that have low grade or grade one disease or grade two disease tend to have more of the somatostatic receptor expression on their surface. And as they get a bit more rapidly growing, they become more FDG avid. They take up more of the radioactive sugar as they're proliferating as well. And we can use that to our advantage in terms of the way we use the GAPA PET scans and FDG PET scans as well. And this is an example of a patient with a well differentiated urinary consumer um, showing you the GAPA scan with multiple liver lesions here and also a small bowel primary there. And then when we do the FTG PET scan, we would expect to be a very slow growing tumor. It's not gonna take up radioactive sugar because the cells are growing very, very slowly. And you see that the FTG PET scan is normal in those sites of disease. You'll see uptake within the kidneys and the bladder, which is normal. So we can use that as getting a way of getting an idea of tumor behavior rather than having to biopsy every lesion. And we use that quite to our advantage in treatment of patients as well. 
And this is another one of our patients who had what's called an insulin numb. She had a, a pancreatic tumor producing insulin. And on the, this is the GAPAID scan here, and she had this single lesion within her pancreatic primary. And then when you do the FTG PET scan, she had this massive disease within the pancreas and also a couple of deposits within the liver as well. And actually we knew that she was producing insulin and it caused severe low blood sugars. So we wanted to shut down the insulin production. And we knew that most of the insulin is from her slow growing disease. And therefore we have got rid of that disease and the insulin levels came back to normal. So we could quite an advantage doing that. So we, at Peter Mac, we really use all these aspects. We need to have the biopsy of the tumor, a tumor biopsy, to look at the growth rate of the KI67, see whether it's grade one, two, or three. We need to do a CT or MRI. We need to do our gallium scans, an FTG PET scans if we think the patients have more aggressive disease. And it gives us an idea to individualize the treatment. Not all patients are the same. Not all nets are the same from one patient to the other. And even, with, even within the same patient, we can see a lot of differences in tumor behavior, which therefore alters our approach as well. And this is, a, this is what we see in some patients in terms of growth rate. If we look at time here from five, zero to 10 years, and this is our baseline. And we see some patients to see it just remains steady for 10 years or more. And I have patients where I just watch them. I do a scan every year. Nothing happens to their disease. When you see some patients where there's very slow growth with time, suddenly it just goes crazy, or some patients' disease is very aggressive from the beginning. So we get an idea of that behavior by the scans that we do and by the biopsies as well. So how do we treat them? We can either look at surgery, most surgery is trying to cure the disease by getting rid of this as the disease in total, or we use hormonal therapy to reduce the effects of hormone production and slow the growth of the tumor. Um, we also target the liver if there's predominant liver disease, PRT, which most of you know about, radioactive hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, and now the biological agents, epilimus and sudipine. I'll talk a little bit about all of those. In terms of surgery, what we're trying to do is remove all the tumour. And we generally do that for remove the primary, sometimes the lymph nodes, or if there's liver involvement, only if we can remove all the liver disease in one shot. And basically, if we can achieve that, we can achieve a 100% 10 year survival rate if it's slow growing disease. There are some which will do an aggressive debulking, so when we know that we'll remove, say, 80 to 90% of the disease, trying to prolong patient survival. That's something we tend not to do at Peter Mac, because it's no good data to show that's useful. And often with the patients with the small bowel nets, um, they do have problems with this lymph node mass within the small bowel causing scarring, and can cause, as I said, bowel obstruction or starves this small bowel blood supply. And therefore, what we try and do is, if we can, patients, especially if they have abdominal symptoms from a small bowel primary, we'll try and remove that at surgery if we can. And we can also, if there's liver only disease, sometimes we can also use what's called radiofrequency ablation, or we, there is some data with liver transplantation if there's liver only disease. But that's the only way you can cure the patient. There are some centers in Europe and US which actually do liver transplantation as well. The results are probably about the same as you get with PRT in some patients. It's not something we have in Australia because of the shortage of liver supply. What about the medical therapy? And that really is in patients with where we can't resect all the disease, we then use medical therapy. And we really, as I said, we base that upon the grade of the tumor. What is the histo what is the growth rate of the tumor? And there's we divide these patients up into three grades, grade one, two, and three, based upon what we see at the time of biopsy, in terms of what we say in the chi 67. 
And this is just an example of that. For example, this is the net nearing consumers, grade one, two, and three. And we're looking at what's called a KR67. We're seeing how quickly the cells are growing. And grade one, very small percentage of cells are growing with these little brown spots. Grade two, about up to 20% of cells are growing. Then you have grade three, where almost all the cells are growing as well. And we use that to look at the biopsy to get an idea of tumor behavior. And it is important because we know that patients with grade one or grade two disease have a much better survival than the patients with grade three disease. And that alters the way we manage these patients as well. And in terms of the most important medical therapy we have, that's the somatostatin receptors, the hormone injections a lot of you will be getting, the octreotide or lanolin type. And that's based upon these tumor cells, as I said, having these somatostatin receptors on the surface of the cells. And we know that if we can block that receptor with somatostatin or lanreotide or octreotide, we can decrease the growth of the tumor, we can decrease the hormone secretion, and we can decrease cell growth as well. So they have an effect in terms of decreasing the hormone production, decreasing the, um, the carcinoid syndrome, the diarrhea and flushing, or if there's pancreatic tumors, decreasing their hormone production. But also they have what's called an anti proliferative effect. They actually decrease the rate of growth of the tumor, either stabilize it or actually decrease the size of the tumor. And that's based upon two large trials, and the most recent one is what's called the clarinet trial, which looked at lanreotide. And these patients had um, a whole variety of different nets. They were watching them for about 24 weeks. Then they started them on lanreotide versus placebo, and seeing what the growth rate of the tumor is. And the majority had, you know, at least 10% of liver involvement, and either from the pancreas or, other, or, the, or the small bowel were mainly involved. And they showed that those patients that received lanreotide had a much better disease control rate compared to those that did not. And now lanreotide has been approved by the PBAC the federal government for its anti proliferative effect. And octreotide has the same activity as well. Patients that have the somatostatin analogs, the octreotide lanreotide, if the disease gets worse, what do you do? Our next step would be PRT. I'm sure some of you have already had that through Peter Mack and Rodney's and his team. And that's based upon the fact that, as I said, these tumors have these somatostatin receptors on their surface. We can attach octreotide to a radioactive atom, such as lutetium or now yttrium. And what they do is the cells then internalize that radioactive atom and the tumor cell gets zapped from the inside and gets killed off. And we use it in patients whose disease, whose patients has symptoms which we can't control with the hormone injections or whose disease is growing despite the hormone injections but they still have to have a very high level of expression of the somatostatin receptors because that's what targets the radioactivity. If there's no receptors or low level receptors, you're not going to get enough radiation therapy there. And Peter Mack's probably the second or third largest PRT provider in the world. We've been, and Rodney's has been doing that for about 20 years now. And the largest series came out of the Netherlands, um, they had about 500, about 300 patients, showing you that almost 70 to 80% of patients had some form of disease control or stabilization of the disease. And those patients that responded had a better survival compared to those patients that did not. I mean, that's in that Dutch paper, there's a whole ragtag of patients in terms of different types of disease, the extent of prior therapy, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not a uniform population of patients. This is an example of one of my patients who had what's the pancreatic net, 
whole extensive disease in bones and lymph nodes and liver, a young girl with a gastronoma, and who had um, PRT, and this is her gamete scan three months after the PRT, showing a very marked response. And she was a young girl, about 15 or 16. She thought she wasn't going to live very long, thinking she went overseas every year, and she realised she was going to live, and now thinking, well, I better get my career in the <laughs> Now she's getting married, thinking about having children. And this is another example in one of my patients who had very large gap had a deposit in the liver, and this is at the time of PRT, and it's actually getting smaller. And we do see patients whose disease does get smaller with time for PRT. Sometimes we get an early response as they're having it, or three months after they finish PRT. In some patients we can see an ongoing response going for at least uh, 18 months to two years, and it can last for a very prolonged period of time as well. The most important study in PRT is what's called the NETA-1 study. This was published a couple of years ago. And it's the first randomised trial looking at PRT to see how well it works. And these were patients that had small bowel nets. They had around 30 milligrams of octreotide LAR and progressed. And so these patients were either had PRT or high dose octreotide LAR at 60 milligrams. And, he found, and it was found that patients that had the PRT had a much better disease control duration compared to those with a higher dose of octreotide. And a better overall survival. And better old disease control rate compared to the placebo as well. So it shows you a prolonged period of disease control and better disease control in terms of disease growth rate as well. And it looks like you may see an overall survival benefit as well. And it's the first, in first randomized study, I mean, patients being put into one or the other group showing the advantage of PRT. And now it's been approved by the FDA in America, it's been approved by the European authorities, and they're trying to see can it be approved in Australia. But at the moment, patients are getting access to it through other ways of funding. We also have biological agents available to us, and two of those is Everolimus or Sunitiv. And in Australia, they're only approved now for pancreatic nets. And we do know that Everolimus is a novel tablet, and what it does is attacks this molecule inside the net cell called mTOR. mTOR is like the powerhouse of the tumor cell. It produces energy, allows the cell to, to make proteins, etc., allows the cell to grow. Nebulimus blocks that in neuroendocrine cells. And it's been shown in a number of studies um, in pancreatic neuroendocrine cells showing that Everolimus versus placebo has again much better disease control and survival. And it's also been shown in this study um, involving a whole variety of nets, including lung nets, rectal nets, small bowel nets, again showing that in this group of patients, we're also seeing a disease control in favour of Everolimus compared to placebo. But in Australia, it's only approved for pancreatic nets. But I have used it in patients with duodenal nets, in lung nets, etc. In the case of sunitinib, um, it has also been assessed in pancreatic nets, and these patients were, in this study, were randomised to either sunitinib versus placebo. And what sunitinib does, it blocks the blood vessel formation within tumours. We use sunitinib in kidney cancer, in special types of gastrointestinal tumours as well, and it did show activity in patients with pancreatic nets, showing that patients that received sunitinib versus placebo, the sunitinib group had better disease control duration compared to placebo. And it's also been approved in Australia. The problem is in Australia, we can't have patients who had Everolimus and failed and disease progress, they can't get access to sunitinib. You can only have one or the other. Um, 
unless the patient is very tolerant to say whoever likes and therefore they can get some, some of the tricks we play with the PDS. So we've talked about octreotide, lanreotide, we've talked about PRT, the biological agents. There's also liver directed therapies where we can actually target treatment specifically to the liver. And it's generally in patients who have a lot of liver disease, who have disabling symptoms from their liver disease, or producing a huge amount of hormones not controlled by any other way because of liver disease. And we therefore can put little sponges into the blood vessels of the tumour to kill off that area of tumour. Or we can actually put in radioactive glass beads or surf spheres into that tumour to try and irradiate that tumour. So a whole variety of case series showing very good responses with um, surf spheres, for example, or with um, chemotherapy sponges, some of them showing improved quality of life and improved symptoms. There's never been a randomised trial of patients having one versus the other, for example. And we do that in some patients. Sorry, yeah. can I interrupt um, yeah. and ask you a question because I'm yeah. tricky. Um, when we were at the ENETS conference in mm -hmm. Barcelona, on one of the days they were talking about um, trialling intra-arterial PRRT, yeah. so the nuclear medicine hormone treatment mm -hmm. via an artery yeah. to a... Can you we've, done, we've done some of that. We've okay. done about three or four cases in Melbourne okay. at Peter Mac. And when would you do that as opposed to just normal PRRT? If we're finding that we're not getting... If the patients have really good hormone receptors on their tumour, so we can try and target it, but we're finding that by giving the intravenous PRT, it's not as we're not getting the great response we want. We will then, and if we can, if it's just localised to certain parts of the liver, we can then deliver the PRT through a, an artery in the liver straight to that tumour. So we do that selectively. In, you know, we've done it about three or four patients. So it's it's to try and get a better and dosage. Really get a better that higher that dosage liver. to that tumour. And what's your sense of? Because I know that was just being talked about in clinical trials. Uh, so I yes. think that's. You know, I think we've only had seen individual patients. We really haven't seen it done in a randomised fashion. Yeah. Um, so it's a watch this space. I think it's watch this space. Yeah. Thank you. I'll next talk about chemotherapy. Um, and we generally use chemotherapy in, especially in the grade one, grade two disease, and those patients that have had everything else, have had hormone therapy, PRT, bilateral agents, will then think about chemotherapy. We'll think about chemotherapy more upfront in the more aggressive disease, because I said they don't express the hormone receptors, so hormonal therapy or PRT may not work. And there's a whole variety of chemotherapy agents we can use, um, especially if it's a grade one, grade two disease, we'll use what we now call Cape Tim or Cape Cytobine Timazolamine combinations, which are oral tablets. Um, and the more aggressive grade three, very aggressive tumours, will use cisplatin or carboplatin or topocyte. So again, depending upon the grade of the tumour, we'll then determine what type of chemotherapy we use. So this is a schema of the way we think about NETS. You can either treat it by surgery, if it's resectable disease, or to try and debulk, there's a lot of disease, or prevent complications like bowel obstruction. We can have symptomatic treatment to try and decrease hormone production, or just symptoms due to the disease by hormone therapy, biological agents, liver-directed therapy. If you want to reduce the rate of disease growth, we'll then use hormones, biological agents, PRT or chemo. And there are some patients we just watch and wait. There are some patients which have very low volume disease, very slow growing, not causing symptoms, I will watch those patients. And if the disease starts to move, we'll then start to treat them at that stage. But it's a team effort um, requiring a whole number of medical specialists and surgeons and endocrinologists and, ca and cardiologists, etc. And we all work as a team um, to try and get the best for our patients. Any questions? I just had one um, regarding the, uh, the problems to the heart. Mm -hmm. If the heart's affected, um, I would 
there's still be someone who mentioned stents prior to uh, treating the heart condition with stents rather than um, valve replacement. Well, what they would do with, before they would do a valve replacement, they'll often do what's called coronary angiogram right. to see how well the blood vessels of the heart are. Right. And often the patients will have, they'll do the stents to relieve a blockage within the heart right. blood vessels. And some patients at the time when they have their valve replacement may actually have bypass graphs as well. Um, two questions. Number one, um, is there anything up and coming that's new? Mm -hmm. in the pipelines, but yep. specifically with PRRT, I read an article uh, that there's some places, I think in Texas or somewhere, that they're using something instead of lutetium. Uh, uh, lutetium does beta waves and this other substance does alpha waves, which is supposed to be mm -hmm. uh, potentially more effective in yeah. killing tumour cells. There's more, in terms of the drug treatment at this stage, there's in terms of chemotherapy, we've probably reached a plateau, I would imagine. Um, we're probably, we're currently using a, a lot of different regimens, and we're basically trialling those different regimens on the same patient, for example, if the disease is not working. So that's sort of plateaued at this stage, and there are current trials to see well, which combination of chemotherapy is better than that combination of chemotherapy. There's probably more activity in terms of the biological agents, um, drugs called axitinib or carbazantinib, which are drugs which attack different pathways within the tumour cells, and they're assessing those types of drugs, mainly pancreatic nets, for example. So we might see more activity in that regard. Uh, in terms of the radio traces, there's a lot of different activity in terms of whether you use beta particles or alpha particles, etc. So there's a lot of work in that regard to see whether you get higher doses of radiation therapy. Um, there's also uh, drugs such as we've been trying a drug called JR11, which is a, a has much more stickier on the hormone receptors than lutetium is, and therefore we're testing to see whether that's a better way of targeting these tumours rather than lutetium. So there's a whole lot of activity in that regard as well. So currently in Australia, there's um, there's a couple of trials looking at. Um, one chemotherapy combination versus the other in grade three disease. Um, there is also a trial being developed by um, myself and also by Grace Kong about PRT versus chemotherapy in patients with high grade disease but have hormone receptors, for example. So there is activity in that regard. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, LICA, I think that's the pronunciation, yep. um, caused by niacin deficiency. Yep. So would, I guess, an effective way to treat that, the symptoms of that be vitamin B tablets? Yeah, we don't know. Um, we've actually, <coughs> I think that makes logical sense to do that if you've got a lot of hormone production. Um, we don't know whether that's the best way of treating it in terms of preventing any patients with carcinoid tumours. I have a PhD student, Erin Kennedy, or Erin Perry, Perry Lang, who has done a PhD looking at the nutritional aspects of NEMS, and part of that was looking at vitamin levels as well. And they found, not just her, but other groups, found about 25% of NEMS patients did have vitamin deficiencies. The issue is, do we then give vitamin replacements to those patients? And we just don't know that. And at the moment, we're trying to develop guidelines in that regard. So Erin's written a fact sheet, um, which is on our website, um, about nutritional deficiencies based right. on the research yep. um, findings so far. Um, and the recommendations are that if you've got carcinoid syndrome, it's probably worthwhile taking yep. a vitamin B3 um, supplement because it's a water-soluble vitamin and doesn't build up in the body. Um, to you know, if you, if you have more than you need, you'll pee yep. it out. Um, and just anecdotally, <coughs> I've, I've had lots and lots of patients now. I'm, I'm, I'm more aware of the symptoms of yep. Allegra. Lots of people with nets tell me they've got really itchy skin, and there's been yep. lots of anecdotal. You know, people coming back to me a week later saying I've started taking vitamin B3 and my skin is mm. actually much better. So we, anecdotally, we don't have, you know, lots of trials. We don't have, we don't trials, have very good but, data. But, um, but, we also see skin yeah. itches in patients that don't have carcinoid syndrome. The problem is with these tumours, they're often producing a lot of other different hormones, which we just not, we can't measure. It might be at least 40 to 50 different types of hormones that have been produced, and we cannot measure them, most of them. We just don't know. We see a whole variety of different symptoms. Patients with 
itches or electrical sensations underneath their skin, for example. But it responds to treatment. Yeah. Um, any feedback? I'm on a, an immunotherapy trial at the moment. Yep. Uh, do you have any um, uh, feedback on how effective or otherwise that might be for me? Um, we've got a couple of patients on immunotherapy trials, whether it's a single agent or combination agents. I've seen, probably at best I've seen sort of stabilisation of disease in patients with pancreatic nets. Um, and based upon the literature, recently published literature, it probably has a bit more activity in the lung nets rather than the pancreatic and small bowel nets. Um, so it just, I think it's just watch the space. I think it's very early days yet. And probably we're not seeing the, the spectacular responses you're seeing in, say, melanoma or bladder cancer, for example, or certain types of skin cancers. We're just not seeing those types of responses. Thank you. Is there anybody doing any research on thymic nets at all? Um, not in Australia, as far as I know. I'm sure there might be some overseas centres doing that. But the, the treatment approach is very similar to the mid-gut nets, for example, and the way we approach that. And often they're, they're associated with the immune syndrome as well. While people are just thinking about more questions, can I add mm -hmm. another couple in? I'm going to do a double barrel one if I can be really cheeky. Um, it's about somatostatin analogues, so the sandostatin or the lanreotide injections. Yep. The first question was one that actually um, came through today um, uh, from someone interstate and I said, oh, I'm going to see if I can pick Michael's brains about this at the support group tonight. Um, they are having sadostatin injections and they noted, their doctor noted on the PET scan that there seemed to be a small spot on their bottom where they'd been having their injections and, and they thought it might be an artifact from that injection, which sort of maybe makes sense to me. I was just wondering if you've noticed that. That's very common. Yep, okay. Yeah. I mean, because the Gatate scan doesn't just show nets, it also shows um, inflammatory cells. So you will see it pick up injection sites. Um, if patients have got other inflammatory disorders, we'll also pick that up as well. And is that why we delay the scans after some no, that's, operation? Or? Um, yes, yeah, yeah. That's what we generally wait at least six weeks after an operation before we do a gap scan. Yep. And the second question I had, which was about somatostatin analogues, it, it is for people who are getting um, difficult side effects with one or tumour growth with one, is there any utility in talking to their doctor about swapping to the other one? I'd probably swap, if they are having problems with side effects with one, I'd swap to the other and they have better tolerance. Um, sometimes if they're on sandostatin or triotype, that has less coverage of the type 5 receptor. Same coverage as type 2. There's five different types of receptors. Octreotide has good coverage of type 2, not as good coverage of type 5. Lamriotide has type 2 and type 5 coverage. So you may wish to change. But I think in those patients where who have progressed on reasonable doses, you can actually dose escalate. And we have seen responses in patients with higher than the standard doses going from say 30 milligrams of LAR to 50 or 60, or lamriotide might be 120 to 180 to 240. And in fact, 30% of patients have better responses that way, but most of those patients will then go on to the RT. Any questions? Well, it's, uh, hi Michael, how you going? Hi. Um, silly question, but do I have to worry about my kids uh, getting, uh, well, I've got a pain um, uh, Do I have to worry about them, uh, you know, when they're in their 30s or 40s, uh, getting something like this? I mean, P-nets, the pancreatic nets are associated with various types of familial syndrome. So I think in the younger patients presenting with that, we'd often refer them to family cancer clinic. So in, uh, so when I'm thinking about my kids, well, yep. I worry about thinking about getting them DNA tested for that or? Well, no, it'd probably be best to go through a family cancer clinic they will talk to you about, they'll go through a very detailed family history yep. of you and your relatives, etc. And if they think it's a reasonable chance, they would suggest you, we perhaps should do a gene screen on you first and talk to you about the pros and cons of that gene test. And if they do find a gene, this is what we like to do, whether you want to do that or not. 
right. and, and also the potential for screening of your other relatives as well. So it's a very detailed process rather than just straight going to DNA testing all children. Right. And it's a great segue because we've got um, a geneticist from Peter Mack coming to our October meeting.